What's going on everybody, Gunner here. Uh, today's video, we're sticking with the theme of modern musky meat, and I'm gonna show you guys how to tie <clears throat> the multi-segmented tube fly extended body dropper shank weight balanced material damped composite dubbing looped build a beast. <laughs> Sorry, Johnny King always gives me a hard time because when I make flies and take fly photos, I try to describe the whole fly with the title <laughs> and so my names are forever long but that's what we're doing we're taking tube fly extended body multi small little segmented joints we're going to build a custom dropper shank we are going to weight balance the fly with some hollow steel beads which are going to double as material dams and finish it off with a bulkhead composite dubbing loop this is a really cool big fly platform that i call the build the beast this is my i don't know final but my favorite version of the fly that i've designed to date and it is musky perfection now uh, besides the fact that the name for this guy is forever long please understand that this is just a hollow fly a really really big hollow fly this is bob popovic's beast fly this is my adaptation of it to musky fishing that i have refined now for about four and a half five years i've refined this pattern down to this is my favorite layout for the greatest success and the greatest castability um, but the only thing you need to tie the whole fly is bucktail and the only skill you need to truly have and have mastered is how to hollow fly how to hollow fly tie, how to hollow tie, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, how to turn bucktail backwards and make it really big. That's the only skill you need to possess as far as proficiency at tying. Um, I'm going to do the full build breakdown. The tubes, the shank, how to design the shank and, and bend it out, what tools I use, uh, the steel beads, why I'm using the beads, aka weight balancing, uh, how they help balance the fly, how they help the fly cast, how I'm doubling them up and using them as material dams to make the shank tying go very fast and then because in modern musky meat episode one i showed you guys how to do a reverse bulkhead i thought we would add to your tying skill repertoire by doing a composite bulkhead dubbing loop so it's just a fun way to get a really clean finish a really bulky clean finish uh, and it's just another skill to have it's another skill to have so before we jump into the full build i thought we talked just a little bit and compare episode two to episode one one to two right so the musky double <clears throat> if you just look at the flies you're like they're both big flies they're both tied out of bucktail why would i tie one over the other it's a good idea so let's break this down so if you remember at the start of the musky double episode i went over kind of some key priorities for me as the designer that i wanted the fly to do first and foremost i wanted it to be big we're imitating suckers chubs fall fish these are some rough fish that are pretty decent size, 10, 11, 12, 14 inches. So fly size was critical, but I didn't want to deal with multiple hooks. I wanted a single hook, which means where that hook is matters, i.e. slipping it back towards the middle of the fly because pike and muskie, when they feed on large forage fish, they tend to grab and smash them in the middle. Their teeth aren't designed to cut like, say, barracuda or something. They're designed to puncture and grab. They then take it down to the bottom and gnaw the crap out of it, swallowing it and turning it head first. Right? So they tend to grab big forage right by the midsection. So being able to slip that hook back, if this was a short shank saltwater hook, you miss the fish, even on a very positive eat, which sucks. I'm not talking about stinger rigs in the tail for tail nippers. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about running a single hook for a proper hook placement on a positive eat on a big fish. Now what's interesting, the build a beast this shank layout, this dropper shank, it solves all of those, right? The extended body, you get your length using just bucktail instead of quite expensive hackles. Uh, and those have some pros and cons there as well. Uh, we did to do a custom dropper shank so you can design the length that the hook is displaced rearward in the fly. That's customizable, uh, customizable to meet your needs. Saltwater guys can make it very short and mimic a short big game hook that they can then split ring on and off hooks at their leisure. Uh, Pike and musky guys can slip it back farther relative to how long the pattern is. So it's 100% scalable because it's a custom build. Uh, and they, it's, it meets the same needs. So 
my priorities are being solved by both the flies. So then why tie one over the other? And the big difference between the two is action. They tend to be equal and opposites. So the musky double fits in this kind of category of maybe you could call it a glide bait or you could call it a momentum train fly, uh, something like that. But it's typically what most people look for in their musky flies, which is for the fly to show its profile. Uh, that's one of the biggest triggers kind of in musky fishing, a fly that rounds forward, turns, and it kind of just sits there. It's a wonderful trigger to have. And if you remember, we have this kind of loose joint because we just have a shank, and then we have a really heavy hook in the back. And that heavy hook, as that front hook slows down, the heavy hook is going to ram it forward. It's going to turn the whole fly. The hackles, which are limp, are going to stay to the rear because the stems are going to bend. This is kind of a big critical difference here. And the fly is going to suspend because it's all neutrally buoyant materials. Wonderful action. Beasts do not work that way. In the slightest, uh, beasts have typically a stiff tail joint. This is extended on 30 pound uh, perlon hard monofilament leader material. That's the name of the product. I don't make these names up. Anytime I use a weird name, it's the name of a product. Perlon hard monofilament leader material, <clears throat> and so it's stiff. So in order for this fly to turn sideways, it would have to drag all of that bucktail with it. So it tends not to do that. Typically, stiff tailing materials act almost like a stability device and they keep the fly going in a straight line. And you might think, I don't really want that in my musky flies. Well, fair enough, you might not, which is why I'm giving you some options here. Uh, but this build a beast has resulted in my biggest musky of the year. Uh, and that morning, I met a young guy who was out there who wanted to get his first musky on the fly. He had actually just done it before I got there. And I gave him the best dropper shank build a beast that I've ever tied. Uh, and a week and a half later, I get a message from him, and he stuck an absolute monster on it. And then this fall, I was fishing with a buddy, and I was fishing a bigger version of this, like out to 12 and a half. And we moved the biggest muskie either of us have ever seen. In fact, it was so big, its head was so wide, I thought it was a sturgeon. <laughs> Which is the only reason I stay calmed when I let it into the figure eight, or else I would have been flipping a lid, because the thing was over 40 pounds. That thing was an absolute monster. Uh, and the fish weren't that hot that day. We didn't get him to eat it. He was kind of just nipping at the tail going around in the eight. But the biggest fish I have ever seen was moved on this style of fly. So this style of fly has a few other characteristics that make it ultra successful, even though it's not a profile showing, suspending kind of glide bait, if you will. So then what on earth makes the beast so successful? Uh, it has kind of two swimming characteristics that I think are really important, and a third, which is castability. Uh, but the swimming characteristics are profile and swim. I like swimming characteristics, it swims. But what you have to understand, this fly doesn't really swim. This fly's action is the strip and pause. That's the action. If you just pull this thing through the water really fast, it's kind of like that. It doesn't do very much. But this, all of these wide open hollow ties, all of this flare, all of this water disturbance with this super dense head, this kind of limp tail with all of the tips. Look at these tips, bucktail tips, bucktail tips, bucktail tips, look at the tips. The tips are what move, right? Because bucktail's a tapered fiber, so the tips are super limp. So they can take all of this hydraulic disturbance caused by this bulkhead and they can swim. This thing swims unbelievable, second to none. It's one of my favorite flies for that reason. And because we're building this thing literally one step at a time from start to finish, instead of using something long to generate silhouette, we're using just hollow ties and we can make it as long as we want. I have 100% control of the silhouette from start to finish. I can make the biggest profile bait possible. And that's significant because muskie eat huge profile bait. Have you ever held a 14 inch sucker? It ain't little, it's huge. There's like a pound and a half fish. Like they eat them like, like it's a hamburger, like it's just down the hatch. They <laughs> That's what they eat. <clears throat> so your ability to make a huge silhouetted fly tells them exactly what it is, food. And then the fact that it swims like a true fish, it's food and it's just it just sells them. And then what sells me because maybe you prefer the jackknife and there's a handful of flies that can kind of do both they can swim like a beast and they even swim maybe more accentuated than the beast and they can glide in jackknife but where they fail is castability 
This is the greatest casting large profile fly ever designed by anybody. And I'm gonna make it even a hair better with these hollow steel beads at 0.2 grams a piece. <clears throat> this thing, this specific one is the best one I've ever done. You don't even know it's there. It feels like you're casting your fly line, which is a principle developed by Mark Sadati, right? So we're gonna take weight balancing flies, apply it to the beast on a custom dropper shank rig for ideal hook placement on the largest silhouetted swimming build -a beast So let me break down the rig and all the tools, everything you're gonna need real quick. Uh, first and foremost is bucktail. You're gonna need bucktail. Uh, what I'd recommend is you do all of the tail section till you get to the shank with the same bucktail. If you start switching bucktails here, you're gonna get yourself in a lot of trouble because every tail has very unique characteristics as far as the stiffness, the waviness, the amount of trapped air, obviously the length. Uh, and so you'll have a really hard time getting a nice perfect taper if you're switching tails all the time. So find one tail has to be fairly high quality if you're gonna do the same spacing as me. If it's shorter hair, like four inch hair, you just make the tube shorter, put them closer together. That's all. That's the only adaptation you have to do, which just means you'll be tying an extra one or two tubes, so it takes longer. Not a big deal, but four and a half inch hair is about ideal. Tends to be double A grade. Double A grade bucktail is what you're looking for. I get most of this from Musky Fool Fly Fishing. It's the Primo Tail line of tail, uh, usually done by Brad Bowen usually done. It's done by Brad Bowen. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> uh, we're going to tie that bucktail for the tail section onto tubes. This is HMH, small rigid tubes. And what we're going to do is I'm going to cut these to about half inch in length and I'm going to tie in the middle joint. So if you tie in the middle and they're all cut to a half inch, the tie in points will be a half inch in between each other. And then we're going to slide all of that on. We're going to do like seven of them. You can do anywhere from five to about eight uh, eight's pretty unruly if you use the thin mono in the small tubes, but we'll do about six or seven. And then I'm going to run that through Perlon hard monofilament leader material. This is mono that is perfectly straight, has all of the memory taken out of it, and it fits and lines the small rigid tubes perfectly. You can use larger tubes. You can use larger mono. The stiffer the mono, the less swim you're going to get. You will get more swim out of lighter mono. Uh, musky will not just come and bite the mono off. Again, their teeth are not like barracuda teeth or shark teeth. They don't just come and slice stuff. They grab and puncture. Their teeth are like, ah, like pokey things. <laughs> they can be sharp every once in a while, but for the most part, these flies are gonna last a good long while, uh, like, like 30, 40, 50 fish type long while. I'm not talking like three or four or five. Uh, just being rigged with mono. There's nothing out the back. There's nothing for them to get any leverage on. It would be like trying to take this with no tension on it and trying to cut it with dull scissors. It's gonna take a heck of a lot of time. And the tubes, for the most part, are covering it and keeping it safe. So it's just 30 pound to get the maximum action. You can go stiffer. You can also line it with a whole different host of things like nylon coated stainless steel if you want it to be bite proof or nickel titanium hybrid wire if you want it to be bite proof. You can use things like Dacron if you want it to be super duper limp. You might have to run into following issues so you might have to have a stiffening joint right where it connects to the shank. This is the simplest solution, 30 pound hard monofilament. Now, we're gonna build our own shank. To do that, I'm gonna use 51 thousandths of an inch stainless steel torsion straightened wire from lurepartsonline.com. In order to bend that into the correct shape, oh, I've rubbed all the lettering off. Well, forget it. But it's called the Dubro Bucktail Twister Tool. It's just, I like to do my wire bending in hand. I didn't want a big vise setup and stuff like that. I just wanted to do it in hand. Uh, and this one was the most cost effective and I don't have that much money. So <laughs> Bucktail Dubro Bucktail Twister Tool. Those two things are a match made in heaven. Now that's going to allow us to drop hooks. We are going to split ring hooks to a dropper loop. The dropped loop is gonna give the hook extra leverage so that it keels perfectly true every time, even if you're swapping off lighter or heavier hooks. You can run them with a treble. I find about a mustad one ought to be kind of the perfect size and perfect balance. If trebles are not your jam, don't worry about it. VMC makes an inline single that you split ring on. The three out is about perfect. They also make a saltwater version. 
that's huge. So if you want to use a huge saltwater version, go for it. <laughs> On top of that, we're going to do this really cool weight balancing concept from Mark Sadati. I have played with so many different size of the, sizes of these beads and quantity of these beads. The 3 16th of an inch hollow steel beads is what you want. You can use copper for a hot spot or the black nickel. They weigh 0.2 grams a piece. We're going to use four of them, which is 0.8 grams. Beast flies, when tied correctly, need next to nothing to weight balance them. But a little bit of weight is quite beneficial. If you go to like the 1.2, 1.4, 1.6 gram weight by using larger beads or using too many of them, you'll notice it'll feel heavy because bucktail, when it gets wet, slicks down and has no air resistance. So if you have no air resistance and you have weight, it's not very fun to cast. If you have very little air resistance and a little bit of weight, especially right at the front, it'll cast like a dart. That's what makes this one so special. All the other ones have different bead layouts, different bead sizes and quantities, so I know which ones are too heavy and I know how heavy each bead is because I've weighed them all. <laughs> this is not a happy accident. I've weighed all of them and I've gone through a bunch of different variations. 0.8 grams using four beads at 0.2 is the greatest casting beast fly I've ever done with a one-aught treble. So that's highly nuanced. You can have some play there. They can be a little heavy or a little light. They'll still cast great. I think I have talked about everything you need for the build, except you will need a dubbing loop tool if you want to do the head that way. Um, some wax. I'm going to use eight thousandths of an inch Vivas monofilament to do the entire fly, including the dubbing loop. Ben Wally, if you watch this, check out the skills. I was talking to him once about trying to do a dubbing loop with bucktail using mono, and he's like, yeah, I'd like to see somebody try that. So we're going to try that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. This is going to be a long fly build. I don't know if I'll get it all done, but the only thing I actually need to show you guys how to do is how to hollow tie. After that, the rest of this is gonna be pretty self-explanatory if you just watch it, even in fast forward. So, let's dive in. Let's build ourselves a beast because it is the counterpart to the musky double. It is a swim fly that has resulted in some monster fists with a monster profile that lends itself to the greatest castability that you can have. And castability is what keeps you in the game. It's what keeps you fresh. It's what keeps you focused. And that's why I settled on the Beast as kind of my all-time favorite musky pattern. Because it has that. It allows me to focus on what I'm doing and not being frustrated by everything that's going on outside of the water. Let's tie a Beast. My goodness, that intro is going to be forever long. If any of you even make it this far, I'll be impressed. And by the way, if you thought I only had one cool camo button up, you're wrong. I got a bunch. Actually, I only have two, but I'm going to add some because Warrior Co., these guys make six shirts. <clears throat> anyway, my cameras right now are being put through the ringer. This is like a torture test. Oh, what's that? HMH Magjaws? Check. Coming in with the converter tool for the HMH standard. Actually, I think they all have the same converter tool. Hang on a sec. I got that thing screwed way the heck out there. One more. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> is that not slick or what? You gotta love HMH. Simple engineering is always the best. <clears throat> I'm gonna take my converter tool here. I'm going to grab my tube so I don't squish the crap out of it and so I can tie on it. I'm going to make it a little bit rigid by throwing a pin in there. We're gonna start right here at the midsection. Get a thread base down come to the middle of that thread base. The first tie is going to be just standard, normal bucktail stuff. Uh, I did miss one material here. I'm going to put some polar flash on about every other tube or every other bucktail hollow tie just to give the fly some sparkle. Another favorite of mine is wing and flash, which I believe is what I use. Yeah, it's what I presented in the musky double. So those are kind of my two favorites. Anyway, <clears throat> let's get a tail on here with a little bit of flash. Now I'm going to show you guys this technique here, just tying in bucktail to the best of my ability. Then I'm going to show you the hollow fly and you're going to see so many sim similarities. So I've taken this off the hide. Uh, I would normally do all of my beast right here. 
this, this middle third is where I would get all of my hair from. You can see I've used it all because it's my favorite spot. So I'm restricted to the tip. That's fine. I'll make it work. It tends to be a little stiffer and a little bit more dead, as in less trapped air. I've taken that bucktail. I pinched it in the midpoint. I took out the small fluff. You can see how sparse this is. I'm going to stack the butts in my hand a little bit. I'm going to cut them perfectly vertical. I'm going to get that guy. My tube fly converter tool gets my hand a little bit off the, the tube a little bit, so it's a little tricky to get it on there. But I'm going to get it on there with a perpendicular thread path, which is important so that when it distributes around, it's in the round and it doesn't get cockeyed and torqued front to back because of my thread pressure on top of it. My thumbnail goes on my thread. I literally hit my thread bump with my fingernail to make sure this gets all even. Now I'm going to kind of hold it in place, draw out as much slack as I can, pull as hard as I can, lock that bobbin up until your thread's nearly going to snap. It should be pretty flipping hard. Tie that sucker down. Now you're going to see the, the bucktail manipulation, the catch, tying it down. All of that is the same with the hollow tie. We're just going to do it backwards and then we're going to flip it around with thread. So if you can do that and become very proficient at tying bucktail in, in that manner, being able to hollow tie is really just your ability to make a symmetrical cone. Uh, that way the hair folds straight back evenly. If you can do those two things, you can tie this entire fly. That's really it. I didn't articulate how to do that flash step. You guys are fine. Just get flash on there. You'll, you'll find a way. Otherwise, if I try to do everything, this video is going to be too long. Now, the tubes can spin freely on the mono. So you don't have to worry necessarily about getting that flash perfectly distributed, perfectly even. Like, it doesn't really matter because the tubes will all interact with each other ever so slightly. And it'll make a really nice flashy fly. Even if you just tend to stick it on one side or the other. Now I can just twist that chuck, boop. And that is my tail tube. It has the least volume. It's tied just straight back like everything else. The flash goes just past the tips of the hair. That is the Wisconsin flame color from Musky Fool. Absolutely killer. Wrong way, I'm gonna get that guy in there. I'm gonna put the pin in just for support. I don't really care that it doesn't go all the way down there. It doesn't matter. Put a thread base down, move your thread to the middle of the thread base. You're going to tie in the same spot on all the tubes. If you hold up another half inch tube and you tie in the middle, you tie in the middle, there will be a half inch between middles, right? That's kind of the whole point here. That's Bob Popovic's spacing, and it's relative to your hair length, which I think I've mentioned about three times now. Come on, brain, catch up here. So I'm going to take hair. <clears throat> Let's just pretend like this is from the sweet spot of my bucktail, but it's not. It's from the tip. Grab it in the midpoint, clean out the butts. I'm going to apply it to the tube the same way we did last time, but it's going to be facing the opposite direction. I'm going to catch that, get a perpendicular thread, three turns to hold it in place with just kind of like light pressure, and it's just so I can manipulate it without it being too free. We're going to smash that around the tube, get it in the round, get it nice and even. I'm going to hold that hair in place while I draw out all the slack, and I get some flare. If this tube, uh, or if this hair was from a kind of a sweeter spot on the tail, it might behave a little better, but this is not bad. I could just tell from touching it that I was going to be able to use it. A lot of times if you get tip hair, it's short and it's dead. I got kind of lucky with the tail that I had left over. I'm going to put just an extra turn or two. Those five wraps are all that's going to hold this, and I am shaking my table and pulling to within about 90% of my thread snapping. That's how much pressure I'm putting on it. I'm going to reef that back, and right now my hand's still on the bottom. Never let go. Those five wraps are under a lot of tension. That's why I have a needle in that tube, or else I'd be bending the snot out of it. I'm trying to make sure that hair goes straight back. Goes from forward to straight back. Don't let it twist off to the side and get caught in other directions. Hold it all back. You can see how having a converter tool is quite nice here because 
it can all just lay back over that perfectly in line instead of having a vise in the way. Just going to kind of soften up the butts, hold them back, and we start building up a cone that's going to go up to the bucktail. Now if your cone only goes up to the bucktail, then the bucktail can only go straight up, but your thread has to go over some of it in order to control the flare angle. Not a lot, but some. Now, as it goes over it, if you bring your thread over it and then you pull really hard, <laughs> you're gonna recompress it, reflare it. You're gonna have to start all over. You need to pull out more thread than you need so you can tie lightly, still consistent pressure, but not heavy pressure, so that you can build the thread up over the bucktail to control how much it flares. Now, if you can build up a nice cone and walk this down, then you can also walk it off. You can set every angle of hollow fly from nearly 90 degrees all the way down. So as you tie these tubes at the half inch spacing, they're going to open up slightly more, slightly more, slightly more, until you have built your entire tail section going from back to front. So because this is my first one, I'm gonna draw out thread. I'm gonna tie with light, consistent pressure. I'm gonna collapse that tail. My thread slipped off, I don't care. I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna pull out thread here before I get all the way up. I'm gonna collapse that tail. I'm gonna get back onto my thread base and I'm gonna tie off. So the next one will be more open. Now here's the cool thing about doing the tubes. Your goal is to make them more open, but if you don't get the order right, when you thread it on the mono, you just change the order to make the tail right. That's what's really cool. So let's do this six more times, putting flash on every other, and I'll see you guys when we start building a shank. So you guys are gonna have to take my word for it, but that was honestly maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> it was not a lot. And if you've ever tried, uh, the hard mono version tying in hand it's pretty intense and it'll take you maybe a good hour hour and a half the first time you try it but check out how sparse that is that's how sparse each one is super sparse not very dense uh, I might make the tube slightly shorter as they go from the tail towards the shank so this right here is what we got to do you got to take your 30 pound perlon hard monofilament leader material again that is the product name I'm not just making up silly long names for no reason put an overhand knot in it the simplest knot if you don't know what an overhand is you shouldn't be a fisherman <laughs> but make a good knot in that you can see i used pliers to tighten it cut that off take your super glue and just touch it and again these tubes never have any pressure on them this doesn't need to be the world's most bulletproof rigging you can come up with they just can't slip off the back. That's all you got to do. I used to put crimp sleeves on here. I used to use this really cool product that you could slide on and off so that you could change things in the tail when you were done. For the most part, most of these things are just headaches, right? Just do the simplest solution you can. We're going to take our tubes. I have seven of them. Find the tube. The 30 pound is a pretty tight fit, but it'll work. It just is harder to get it started and slide that sucker down. Now, you can do a lot of things here if you don't like the taper that you've generated. If you need to add room between tubes, you can put in little glass beads, tire glass beads do a really good job of adding space between the tubes. If you need less room, you take the tube off, cut it, so you can really fine tune the rigging. I did have to change tails halfway through the tail because I was not working with a lot of hair uh, and so we'll see how these this different tail stacks up I am gonna go ahead and shorten that one a little bit you might think that's insignificant and it truly is but I like it oh yeah now we're talking because I shortened that one up I'm gonna shorten this one and the next one so the tubes are getting denser, closer together. I guess that would be frequency, a higher frequency rate as we get closer to the end here. This is my last one. You can see I did flash every other. Yikes. My scissors did something weird. Come on, get in there. That is our beast tail multi 
tube segment. Look at that. And it swims for days, nice, open, super light. You can see just how sparse each station is tied. You can see where my changed the grade of my tail. There's a slight color difference right there. Uh, but it seemed about the same stiffness. Hopefully that, that runs true when it's in the water. Uh, but yeah, that's the beast tail. Didn't take long at all. I didn't need to develop any extra skill set to be able to do that. So let's get this guy on a custom dropper shank build. So 51 thousandths. I'd like to cut a pretty generous section because I got a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm gonna bend out some of that memory. For the most part, it has none, but it's very light. I just bend out a little bit. You're gonna take it in the Dubro tool. I'm not gonna talk too much about the tool because everybody might have different tools. Uh, the important thing is here, you're gonna wanna make a loop. And I'm gonna make two closed loops here. Give me a sec. This tool is pretty fast and easy to use, by the way, if you do check it out. So I'm gonna do some barrel wraps here so that this can't ever open up. I'm gonna try to make the barrel wraps good and tight. Uh, I kind of always forget, somewhere in like three, two to three is fine for what we're doing here. And then I'm gonna cut that tag end as flush as I can. Whew. So that is our closed root barrel wrap with 51 thousandths. Now, <clears throat> this is going to go on my vise in this orientation. One split ring with an inline single. That's why if you're gonna use singles, you have to use the inline single so the hook eye is in the correct orientation, or you can drop a treble, no problem, but I'm gonna grab this with my pliers. I am going to squeeze the snot out of it as I bend that arm down so that it all runs in line. Now you should grab that sucker just make sure it's straight. Now the length that I'm gonna make this is relative to the length of my tail. And so you can hold this up here and you can just kind of guesstimate. Like that might be a good straight bass size. I'm gonna go more towards like here. That's gonna be pike musky size. Uh, I'm gonna do it on here though, cause I know how long I typically do it, which is the full length of this channel. The full length of that channel is the equivalent of an 80 millimeter shank. Now before I bend this, if I just bend it, the fly's not gonna be weight balanced, which isn't a big deal if your bucktail work is nice and light and sparse and open, and also if your head's not crazy bulky. But I'm gonna make my head crazy bulky, and so a little bit of weight's gonna go a long way. So we're gonna take four of these beads and build them into our shank, which is why you can't use a commercially available shank to do this, because you gotta build the beads. These are gonna to serve to weight balance the fly, which is gonna give it a little bit of weight relative to the air resistance of the bulky head and also put the weight in the front to help it soar through the air. And basically, uh, you weight it relative to air resistance so that it's balanced. It's balanced relative to how fast your fly line flies. On top of that, we're gonna use these as material dams, kind of like the Blaine Chocolate uh, material tubing system to flare the bucktail so that we don't have to hollow tie on these four sections. It's gonna be pretty sweet. And I'll get that guy in there. Sometimes I do two, sometimes I do three. Most of the time I don't count. That time I got two and a half and I went, whoops, that's not right. Because then the tag end's sticking up and I don't, <laughs> I don't like it when the tag end's sticking up. I like my tag ends to stick down. I don't know why. I don't have a good reason for it. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna grab that twist that by hand, make sure that they're perfectly perpendicular. Wow, you're so close, but you're not quite there. Yeah, I went too far. So that is the Bramers Custom Flies, custom dropper shank build, weight balanced with steel beads for ideal casting, set to a very huge three inch length for perfect placement on a dropper shank 12 inch beast. Now the cool thing about that dropper shank, bending it down like that gives it extra leverage so that my hook attachment point is below the fly 
it guarantees it keels every time, even if you're using lighter wire hooks or lighter wire singles. Uh, it also allows you to use kind of smaller gapped hooks if you want, because the hook gap is hanging down freely below the, fr uh, below the fly. You can get away with using some pretty light and, and simple trebles, uh, like I've used size two in the past. I don't tend to anymore. I tend to use at least a one extra heavy or like a one up. Those tend to be pretty good. But the other thing, it gives you a ton of bite in your vise. I have literally that whole thing chomped in there so that it ain't going anywhere. Now this wire will be a little loosey goosey way up here because that's a lot of leverage. That's also okay. It's just one of the things you gotta live with. Uh, the first few tie-ins will suck because this is a long shank that you gotta work your hand around, but that is okay. So keep that in mind, I'm going to tag this onto here. Right now the tag end of mono is in the way. Roll it to the top with my fingers, really get a good cinch on it. Walk that down and I have just a little bit of looseness in there, which is totally fine by me. And then I'm gonna hit that with my CA plus to weld all that together and guarantee it for life. We'll have kind of two or three tie-ins back here, hollow ties spacing up kind of as quickly as we can to get up in here and then we're going to run these beads just like that so it's a few days later uh, that is just life with kids i suppose but thanks to the magic of cameras and youtube wear the same shirt y'all don't know the difference right so let's continue with what we got going on <clears throat> we got our crazy long 80 millimeter custom dropper shank with all of our beads to counterweight our hook back here that's also being supported by this tail. This is gonna be about a 12 inch version. Again, the shank is customizable in length. The tail is customizable in length. So saltwater guys, whatever you're doing, big, guy, big game guys, Esox guys, you can kind of put that hook wherever you want, which is kind of nifty. Nifty? Nifty. We're going with it. Uh, so we're gonna dress this with hollow ties all the way up to about editing through this but so far one two three four ties with flash and we've gotten to the beads that has taken me 12 minutes with talking uh, and stuff like that so keep that in mind even though I've edited this that's not slow by any means uh, but these beads are gonna make this so wicked fast so we'll get that right there we'll shove that bead right up onto that glue Now we do gotta get a thread base in front of it so that nothing slips around, right? Let's go back to pink here for a sec. You're gonna choose pretty hollow hair, bottom third area, kind of like bulk hair characteristics. Uh, everything that's been on the shank has been quite a bit denser, which is good. I want that water push, I want that density. Now instead of having to hollow tie this, I no longer have to hollow tie this. I'm gonna keep these butts as clean as I can. This pink is pretty dense and it's because it's all straight fiber. And you can see my thread, when I caught this hair, my thread is right against the bead, as close to the bead as I can get it. That under wrap really contours that bead right 
as close to it as you can get. Now when you flare this, that bead is going to basically give it a hollow angle that we're going to suck all the slack out of. And of course, the, it's going to try to slide away from that pressure, right? The pressure of the bead against it. That's totally fine. Take a second to kind of clean these up if they're a little messy. And now what you're going to do is you're just going to wrap that back toward the bead. And it'll just give it more and more flare as you get closer to it and really cinch it down. Come in front of those butts and tie off. So that's how long your hollow tie takes <laughs> when you get to the bead section of this fly. Now, you can use larger diameter beads if you want kind of more of a hollow angle, if you want it to be more severe. Uh, I find that these small ones, the 3 16 work totally fine anytime you're working with about 12 inches and under. If you were going to try and tie like a massive 16 incher or something yeah you might want to look to a bigger size uh, but then you get more weight and more weight is hard to deal with because these flies are not that hard to cast in fact they're, they're probably the greatest casting fly on the planet <laughs> as far as big flies go uh, so that weight once you get above about a gram uh, starts to become a hindrance instead of something that's benefiting you so keep that all in mind it's just a balancing act because all you guys who tie this pattern, if you do, if you give it a try, you're going to tie it different than I will. You're going to tie it different lengths. You're going to make your hollows different angles. Uh, you're going to select different size beads or whatever beads your shop has or whatever. Which these beads, by the way, you're not going to find at most fly shops. That's not a common thing you're going to find. You're going to have to find them from basically a, a hardware, not a hardware store, like a lure store, a lure building store. Lure Parts Online is a good one. Uh, these ones actually came from Thorn Brothers. I was down there for a seminar, and they had these in stock. And so any place that you can make basically inline bucktail spinners will have the steel beads so that you can do this. I keep, I keep trying to grab that broken pair of scissors, <laughs> which I don't want to do. So I just kind of smash that with glue and then shove the bead into it as tight as I can. The bead kind of glues itself in there. Now when you put this thread base down, you really got to make sure that's on that shank so that it can't slip and get it as close to the bead as you can. So I'm going to make these ends a little bit uneven and kind of messy so I don't have a super straight line. Let's see what we should do. We should probably hollow tie the butts if we're going to do it that way. And use the bead to flip the butts backwards. I'm going to leave the butts long. We'll see how that works. I'll wrap that as close to that bead as I can. Really flare it. Let's see what happens if I push that bead up in there. Yeah. Most bucktail work is just learning to manhandle the bucktail. You can manhandle it, and you can do whatever you want. So I'm going to give that kind of a loose hollow tie. I'm not super concerned about it. I'm going to tie off quickly. Hit that with some super glue. And then ram that bead up onto that thread as much as I can. Now, when that bead, yeah, see, like that's totally fine. You can totally just leave that. You don't even have to trim those if you don't want to. Uh, what I might do is I'm going to tie up to this bead so that the bead can't slip. And I'm going to bring my thread around to the other side of the bead. And now that bead can't slip and I can use it to make kind of a nice cleaner hollow tie against that hair. And then I can just come back down. So I use the bead to be able to form my thread dam instead of taking the time to make the thread dam uh, right next to that hair. And then the bead wouldn't be able to get close to it. 
right? So you're just, just use the bead to your advantage here. You can see the head of this is, it's not haphazard, but I'm definitely off the cuffing for my head design. I'm gonna make a pretty big dubbing loop here. Again, you don't have to use the dubbing loop. You could just do those hidden bulkhead ties that we used on the musky double that I just used right here, but using thread dams to flip over. But I have about a five, six inch loop. Gonna get a dubbing loop tool in there. I have a lot going on right now, so we're gonna try to not mess this up. Hit that with some dubbing wax. I want that bobbin rust to hit my thread so that it doesn't go all over. Now, you also gotta remember, this is an 80 millimeter shank, which is crazy far. So I gotta make this as far out as I can go. And I am gonna hit all of that with just some glue while we're working with everything so that it's, it's locked in. <clears throat> So what we're going to do to finish this fly, and again, you know, like you could put some flash right here, you could put lateral lines right here, you could put feathers uh, in any one of these stacks to make kind of pectoral highlights. I like to keep my beast about as simple as you can, just kind of bucktail and flash and, and don't really overdress it. Just focus on the taper and it'll swim like a machine. You don't really have to do much else to it. Uh, but for the head, we're going to use a, just, I just want to show you other techniques to finish. Um, especially if you're not ultra comfortable with the bulkhead technique and maybe crowding hook eyes and things like that, you can use a dubbing loop and it's really cool. And to make the dubbing loop super dense so we get a lot of disturbance to really animate all of these bucktail tips for a 12 inch fly, we're gonna use a composite loop, just simply meaning multi-material. And I'm gonna combine it with Ian Devlin's 3D slinky blends. So any sort of slinky blend will work. You can use slinky, you can use uh, SF blend, you can use wampa hair, any sort of synthetic. It's gonna have a fine little crinkle. It's really gonna help increase the density and stiffness, get a really blunt, big head on this thing, which is accurate for the forage, which is important, but it's also gonna swim the fly beautifully. So I'm gonna take this dark one, I think it's called bunker back. I have the packaging labels incorrect, so ignore that. And of course, Ian has this blended with some really nice flash, both kind of like a marine aqua green and a purple, which is pretty sick. And that's going to highlight our blue. And again, I am, I am sacrificing the rest of this blue. There's not a lot left. This was one of my Brad Buzzy tails that I've had for years now, and it'll be sad to see it go. Uh, something you can do uh, to get kind of a dark accent is you can start to integrate some of these dark almost like the back fibers here that would be on the top of the tail if this is on the back of the deer uh, they behave a lot like deer belly hair especially right here at the base so you can really integrate some of that into the loop again just for textural complexity but I'm going to take what is essentially two two hidden bulkhead ties worth of hair because that's how much room I have if I were to do this just with thread and just hidden bulkhead, I would use about two to fill in that space. I have a third one right here. So I have tw you know, two stacks worth of bucktail. That's how you can gauge that. You're like, if I would use two stacks here with thread, I'll use two stacks here and a dubbing loop. I'm gonna clean out those butts. I'm going to lay them flat in my lap. I know you guys can't see that. They're just flat in my lap. It's not a big deal. I know you can't see it. It's not a big deal. <laughs> I'm gonna take some Slinky blend from Captain Ian Devlin here. I wish I would stop putting my scissors down. Just clean up the tips a little bit and I'm going to cut this to about two and a half inch little lengths here with the flash blended in it. Yeah, I don't want it to be like crazy, crazy dense, but I want a good amount, right? I really want some push. And I'm just going to make that nice and wide. That's about how wide the bucktail is in my lap. And I'm going to lay the two on top of each other and pick them up as neatly as you can. Now earlier I kind of ragged on using tools. And this is one of those things right here where dubbing loops, man, are all skill. They are all raw skill. And uh, I think tools that people use for dubbing loops, they, they really cheapen it a little bit if you if you can't do it with your hands man what's the point so i'm going to get that nice and spread out you can see kind of how much left over there is to create the bulkhead so everything on this side is my bulkhead everything on this side is kind of my length 
you can get that slinky about 50-50. So the proportions of it are 50% on one side of the line, 50 on other. The bucktail, I don't want it to be crazy, but right about there. Now the way you're going to want to do this <clears throat> is the slinky will help the bucktail not go crazy. Uh, but it's really important that all your fibers are perpendicular to your thread so that when they wrap, they don't twist down or twist up the thread, but they stay perpendicular. You can clamp some of this hair out of the way if you don't want your loop to get stuck on it. But I'm going to pull this. You can see my whole shank flexing. Like I'm going to put quite a bit of pressure towards myself so that it's nice and tense, and I'm going to start spinning it flat. You can see my thread's not up or down, but it's flat, completely flat. You get some good spin to that. Now, this mono, because it's round, it'll really bite that bucktail and compress it, which is what you want, because the moment it kind of kinks, especially because you're using it in that lower third that's behaving like belly hair, it's stuck in the loop. Like, you don't have to be some crazy spin on this thing and make it unbelievably dense. Like, the moment the hollow hair of bucktail is kinked, it's stuck. So you should be able to come in here and pull on these, and they shouldn't tug out at all. So you always test your loops, and that's going to be fine. Now normally, in the dubbing loop, you would kind of like preen this all to one side like a hackle to make it more usable. I find that really hard with the bucktail. I, I tend not to do that at all. I just leave it crazy big like this, and you're just going to work it right here at the shank level is where you're going to try to manipulate it. And we are going to pack this on and you can see me just taking like a quarter turn at a time like there is no hurry here because i'm mostly concerned about how getting it all on there honestly i'm, I'm concerned about <laughs> maximizing the density here i'm going to catch that once i'm going to try to catch it twice in the same spot Really, I'm pulling up with the loop and down with the thread to suck all the slack out. Make sure it's super duper tight. I know you guys can't see it, but it's not a big deal. Bring that back. Get your thread up onto your shank. The nice thing about these barrel wrap shanks at the head is you really can't crowd the hook eye. So they're, they're pretty forgiving when you are working with an absolutely insanely big dubbing loop that's too long and you can't see anything. <laughs> they're pretty forgiving because you're not going to just engulf that hook eye. And then I will put basically a small hollow dam in front of that just so the leading edge is clean. And then I'll come up onto the barrel wraps. I know you can't see it because the camera died, but I'll literally do my half hitching in the barrel wraps. Again, very forgiving, right? Because you're not going to crowd the hook eye because you really can't. You can take a bodkin, a comb, a finger brush, doesn't matter, and work that hair. Make sure that all of the synthetic in it is picked out nice and clean. So you don't really have to do any tripping because all the butts are unevenly layered in that loop, so it's a really easy system. You're gonna take that dropper loop and you are going to split ring a hook of your choice. Again, you can go to a simple treble, like a one-aught treble, Mustad or VMC, anything like that. You can also use these VMCs. Where's my packaging? something like these VMC's inline singles. This is the three aughts. Uh, the three aughts are pretty good for freshwater. Uh, that's the smallest I would go, and I think it's the biggest they make. VMC also has a saltwater gauge version that goes up to like five aught or six aught, something crazy, uh, and those are wicked big. Uh, but I don't mind the treble game, so I'm gonna put a treble on it. This fly build is pretty complex as far as all the stuff you need to pull it off, but the tying technique unbelievably simple so let's get this guy wet hang dry it and i'll show you the finished updated modern musky version of the build a beast so that right there is your finished bug about a 12 and a half inch build a beast all those sick tubes super sparse look how sparse they are they just breathe collapse look at all the movement just the wind animating all that bucktail tips that's what it'll be like in the water. And you got that big one out treble right there. So sick, composite head, ton of push, little bit of complexity, a little bit of flash, custom dropper shank. The build a beast. Thanks for watching.